Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being up here bright and early, second day of the conference. Um, so I head up data infrastructure for Zalando, which is basically uh, everything from business intelligence to the data lake, helping the data scientists across the company. And I'm here to talk about fashion. Before we do that, though, when I was growing up, my father used to say this. You can't really change what's happening, but you can A, plan ahead, and B, you can be ready to react. And I think in that Spark and ML and AI space that we are in, this is really, really important. We can't change what's happening. We can be ready to react. So what is Zalando? For those of you from the States, we are uh, the top online pure play fashion and beauty e-tailer in Europe. And we are a technology company. Therefore, we dress code. We are, uh, we are today selling about 300,000 articles, uh, over 2,000 international brands. Uh, curated shopping, you can actually buy exactly what you want. Uh, we have 17 countries here in Europe that we are uh, in right now and increasing. Over 200 million visits per month. Uh, last year, we had 4.5 billion euros in revenue and growing. We have been uh, public for only three years. We are a 10-year-old company. What we do, the strategy we have is Zalando is a platform. What does that mean? We actually connect brands to consumers. So we sit in the middle. We produce some of our own stuff, but we actually uh, connect the producers, the real brands, with people who want to buy stuff. And of course, as a consumer-facing company, we have to put customer satisfaction first in everything we do. Of course, a lot of people say that. What does that actually mean to Spark and AI? So I thought I would take a real-life example. Um, I live in Berlin. I actually commute from San Jose, California to Berlin. Long story. And uh, therefore, I'm always living out of a uh, bag. What does that mean for my clothes? Well, about two months ago, I had to go give a talk at a conference in Germany, bureaucrats, government, and I figured, you know, my T-shirt would not work. So I thought, let me go buy a jacket. So I went to the Zalando website, and I said, I did a search. Now remember, everything that's happening on this website has to respond in near real time. So I'm talking milliseconds. When I search for a blazer, the same blazer I bought it from Zalando, it's actually got to respond in milliseconds. And then what's going to happen after that is the first thing that I see and the first thing that I pick may or may not be what I really wanted. So machine learning drives these real-time recommendations as I'm working on it. Again, milliseconds. People who browse this item may want to browse these other items. And then, of course, once I've found the item that I want, there's more machine learning behind the scenes, which is telling me, hey, maybe if you're buying a jacket, maybe you need a shirt as well. How about a tie? How about shoes? How about socks? And so the entire uh, set of complementary items, again, in real time, in milliseconds, figuring out what KK actually wants and being able to give it to him. Of course, there's other things beyond that. Once I've selected what I want, what size do I think uh, I should buy? And of course, if I've bought stuff before, I've returned stuff before, we can actually figure out maybe the size that you're choosing right now may or may not be the best one for you. So recommend the right size. And then, of course, the delivery promise. If I need it in two days and I pay for two-day delivery, I should be able to get it exactly in two days, regardless of where it's shipped from and who it's getting to. All of this is driven by machine learning. Here's another example of... Uh, AI in uh, not just the fashion supply chain, but in any retail. If you've got goods that you're delivering to a customer, these are the questions you have to answer. So what am I going to provide? When am I going to provide that? Do I need this jacket in the summer or in the fall? Because maybe the conference season is in the fall. Where do I need to provide it? So if it's a warm summer in Germany, maybe we need to get warm clothes to Germany's warehouses. And if it's a cold uh, summer in England, we need to get the warm stuff here. So, and then how much? What do we expect people to actually buy? How many, in what sizes, in what colors? What does the fashion trend look like right now? 
So this supply chain, the interesting thing is it's actually not unique just to us. Any retailer in the space would be doing the same kinds of things, and it has to be driven by data underneath. So apart from this machine learning part that I talked about so far, where else do we use data in retail? The first thing, of course, is KPI reporting, business intelligence, if anybody's done business intelligence. Uh, what is the data telling us about what has already happened? And then, of course, the machine learning, actionable insights, some of it offline, some of it online, so batch processing for things like the supply chain, because I don't need to respond in uh, milliseconds, but then if I'm doing search and recommendation, that's milliseconds, has to be real time. And then artificial intelligence, which is really how do you take all of these predictive analytics and the prescriptive analytics and automate them, right? If I know what's happened in the past, and if I can figure out what needs to happen next, how do I automate that response? That's what AI is all about. So the challenges that this throws to us is that we have pretty much any tool that you can use in this space, in the data space, we're probably using it in some part of the company. Uh, everything from Spark to uh, Jupyter, Presto, et cetera, et cetera. And our current architecture, by the way, it looks kind of like this. I've simplified this very, very heavily, of course. So what we have right now is a data lake. We made one very interesting choice. We are on the cloud, but we decided to do a data lake without any Hadoop from day one. So our data lake actually has no Hadoop which, by the way, is very interesting given uh, last night's uh, developments where the two biggest Hadoop vendors uh, decided to merge. So, you know, didn't impact us at all because we had decided not to use Hadoop in the data lake at all. What do we use instead? We use Spark. We're on multiple clouds. And this little green box on the left-hand side, which is Nakadi, something very interesting. It's an open source system that we built. It's basically Kafka with an abstraction layer on top of it. Check it out if you guys uh, want to look at it. And then we have a massively parallel processing MPP machine that serves out things to the end users. We also have a data warehouse in parallel to this that I haven't shown in this diagram. So the issue that we run into is, do we give people agility, or do we create the most sophisticated pipeline that we want and then let people use it? So we have at Zalando something called radical agility. Any team can actually build anything that they want, and they can use the best tools for that job, and we will try and support them as much as we can as a central function. We don't stop anybody from using any tools. Therefore, how do you make sure you get that sophistication while getting agility? By the way, inside Zalando, I've got really extremely advanced deep learning AI folks, as well as some very, very basic folks uh, who are just getting into uh, data science. We've got data engineers who are actually doing more, actually data scientists who are doing more data engineering than data science. So how do you help all of these people at the same time? And then again, the use cases. Think about that website experience that I had. How can I make it even better? How can I do this predictive uh, delivery? How can I make sure the fit is right? So the use cases are there, but there's a whole bunch of different sets of people with different skill sets. And so there is a potential for direct business impact with machine learning every day. But because of the agility that we allow people to have, a lot of teams actually reinvent the wheel. So how do we then scale machine learning and AI in a company like ours? This is our plan at this point. Uh, I must, uh, in full disclosure, say we are not Databricks customers as of today, but we are very, very close. We are planning to use Databricks. We start with those teams that are at the early end of that cycle, which is the analytics. So how do you provide them basic end-to-end -end tooling? And how do we provide them consulting? How do you help them get started with machine learning? And so that's where I'm thinking things like MLflow, if it lives up to its promise, it looks really, really interesting, uh, would be able to help us. We do use uh, things like uh, Amazon, uh, AWS, SageMaker, et cetera, today. Uh, we work on Google. We work across a whole bunch of platforms. So, and then people who actually are already doing machine learning, how do you make sure they have the advanced tooling they need for that? How do you get access to TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn? And then how do you do all of these things, regardless of what level of uh, sophistication you're on, how do you do all of these things with governance built in? And what do I mean by governance? It's not about stopping people from using data. It's about making sure people can actually use more data and use it safely, securely, without causing any issues to themselves. So, when I came here and I noticed the unified analytics theme, I was very impressed. And the reason for that is, internally, 
We are actually going towards providing Spark as a service. My hope is to do it on Databricks. We had come up with this exact same thing ourselves, which is how do you take these ETL pipelines in the BI space, for instance, which take hours and hours. We take overnight runs basically today. How do you take those and use Spark to do that? We've already done some part of it. We're hoping to use Databricks or, and other tools in order to do the rest of it. Uh, and it's not just for the data warehouse. It's for the data warehouse, the AI, and the ML. One other thing that we came up with is we find people actually pick up data sets by themselves, and then they create these gold data sets. How about if we did all of these things on this same unified platform, create those gold, silver, and bronze data sets, and use Spark, et cetera, to do a lot of those things? Very quickly, where we are going is right now, we're on S3. We're sitting in Amazon. That's the middle of that, uh, uh, of that circle there. And then we're using Presto. It's schema on read, Presto, and Superset in order to get data out of there. Uh, we use Apache Spark right now, planning to use Databricks. We do use uh, Kafka, which is that Nakati open source that I talked to you about. We use a lot of TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, et cetera. Any of the Keras, any of the things that you can see out there in machine learning, we probably use it. And then where we are going to is this built-in data governance. That's why I'm really excited to see how the catalog, the metadata stores, the, uh, you know, the lineage and stuff that Delta and uh, MLflow will be able to give, how that can help us. So really looking forward to where this goes. Sorry for a little uh, busy slide here. This is my view, not Zalando's view. This is my personal view on where I think all of this is going to go. And what are we talking about? I don't believe we need to have data warehouses and data stores and data lakes and data ponds and all kinds of other places to store data at. What I think what we need really is one unified data access mechanism. The data scientist doesn't really care where that data is stored. What the data scientist cares about is how they get that data. The guy who's the business analyst who uses MicroStrategy or Tableau to look at those KPIs, they don't care where the data is stored. All they care about is that they get it in time, they get the right data, and they're able to actually use it. So my thought is where we need to go is multi-cloud. You can't just be on one cloud because there are things that certain clouds do that are better than other clouds. But for the end user, for that end customer, for us, the internal end customer, they should not worry about where this data is stored. It doesn't matter if it's Google, Microsoft, Amazon, or in your own data centers. It has to be batch and real time, which means those, remember that supply chain use case that I was talking about in retail? That has to be supported, but also those uh, near real time use cases for the recommendation engine, that has to be supported. All from the same set of data, all from the same set of tools. It has to support both structured and unstructured. It has to be fast, it has to offer secure access, and then of course it has to provide all of that catalog information, for instance. What is the data that I'm looking for? Searchable catalogs. We've created a Google-like uh, searchable catalog internally for our data lake, where you can just go in and type sales, and it'll show you all the tables that have anything to do with sales. We need something along that line working across all of these clouds, across this unified uh, data. Now, of course, what I'm hoping is that there is a database in the middle, again, not visible to the end user as to where it is. It could be wherever you want. But that database is where all of this data actually comes and is stored. And you're able to spin up Apache jobs or spin up Spark jobs, whether it's Apache or Databricks or whatever else you want to do. But you are able to spin up ETL jobs, for instance, using the data that's already coming in and then put the results back into the database. And then create this gold data set that I was talking about so that people can actually use it, gold, silver, bronze. Um, and of course, this machine learning tool chain, which has to have provenance. I don't know how many of you saw the uh, presentation yesterday, but I was at the customer advisory board with, uh, with the Databricks guys the day before. And I was at, they asked us, what would you like to see in the machine learning tool set? And I said, you know what would be really cool is that if my data scientists did something three days ago and it worked, they should be able to see the code. They should be able to see the training data. They should be able to see the results. They should be able to see everything and not just see it. If I need to go back to that today, I should be able to go one click and be able to load everything up in a notebook and be able to do stuff with it now. So that if I made a mistake today and I want to correct that, I can go back and do it. 
Guess what they showed us yesterday? That demo was very impressive to me. I think that's the direction that uh, the industry needs to go in. Of course, we'll see how MLflow actually evolves and is able to do all of these things. We'll be keeping a close eye on that. And then, of course, uh, lineage. Who created this data? Who accessed this data? Who else has access to this data? What's going to happen next uh, with this? Being able to go back and see if there was an issue in the chain at some point. And this is part of governance, as I was saying, more positive governance. This is not limiting people from using the data, but giving them more tools to do it. All right. Um, that's it for me. Um, we have about a dozen people in the audience uh, and at the floors. If you guys are interested in hearing more about what we do, want to learn some more, please approach them. We are hiring, so shameless plug. Please uh, come talk to us if you're interested. Thank you very much. <laughs>